welcome. We're going to start looking at the houses first, okay? So the houses are broken up into four different hemispheres. That's northern, southern, eastern, and western. The house system is a 360-degree circle. The Babylonians and the Egyptians were really into mathematics. And so they wanted the the planetary system, the astrology system they use to have to be broken up. It's broken up into four equal parts. 360 degrees circle. Each house is 0 to 29 degrees. Or if you want to say 30 degrees, that's fine. Each house system is broken up into 30 degrees. Each quadrant, there's four quadrants, four hemispheres, four quadrants. Each quadrant makes a 90 degree angle. We're going to start off with the eastern hemisphere, which is to your left, the left side of the chart. Those houses um, are 1, 2, 3, 10, 11, and 12. If someone has the majority of their houses in the eastern hemisphere, they are about the self. They're self-activated, self-motivated. They initiate. They're self-assertive. Anything that has to do with them, they're standing up for themselves. So you might think that they're a bit self-absorbed, but they're not really um, here to focus on other people. So all their karmic lessons will be about self-love. They might have a, even have a hard time with this aspect of themselves because a tendency um, in our society would be for people to tell them that they're wrong. And so throughout their life, they'll have to balance out that negative um, introject that was built up in them in childhood that told them that they were selfish. When they're actually here, to basically be their own brand. These people will um, be motivated, the most motivated when they work alone. They will want the approval of other people. Is it okay for me to focus on myself so much? Like everybody wants to feel accepted, you know, but other people will feel like, well, you don't need us, so we're just going to abandon. They'll feel abandoned, which will lead them to being um, action orientated and um, self assertive they will have they won't have any other choice so it would, that will give them a very strong will and their free will these people will be called free spirited the western hemisphere is to the right it's comprised of the houses four five six seven eight nine. These people, unlike the um, Eastern Hemisphere people, will be other people oriented. Okay, often when I talk to these people, they don't like this. <laughs> they don't like being other oriented. These people often struggle with codependency. And they're not very self motivated. They need partnerships and other people in order to take action. And that can sometimes cause um, them to feel like they're begging for love or begging for help or begging to be heard and begging to be seen. And they don't necessarily feel like they, they put their life into other people's hands more than the Eastern Hemisphere people do. They tend to, um, like I said, uh, uh, I guess a symptom of codependency is not really taking responsibility for <clears throat> your um, fate. So it'll take them some um, extra work to balance themselves out 
in that matter. It's like, well, if my friends or if my partner or if other people aren't going to be with me, say, on this real estate deal, since the eighth house is involved, we'll learn about that, on, on this business deal or whatever, I can get started on my own. I can, you know, um, incorporate other people later on. They have an understanding of, um, also, they'll, they'll learn how to, um, I don't want to say that word, be charismatic. And that's something maybe the hemisp- Eastern Hemisphere people might be a bit jealous of. When you're so self-motivated and self-focused, you tend to not learn this skill of being um charismatic to get other people on your team but people of the western hemisphere are great have great people skills let's look at the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere the northern hemisphere is at the bottom below the horizon and it's comprised of houses one through six these are called the personal houses subjective This is where the person develops their personality, their values, um, their their style of communication, um, their voice, their relationships at home, and their and their childhood um, development, and their everyday life, how they live with themselves. Very great people to talk to and want have one on one conversations with. You might spend a lot of time reading and writing, journaling, thinking. Southern Hemisphere is comprised of houses 7 through 12, and it's the upper half above the horizon. And this is the more social objective. These people, and I'm thinking about my sister, because most of her planets are in the Southern Hemisphere, are almost predestined to be famous or they feel famous because it's like their life is on is in the spotlight they're more social it's more about um, who they are outside the house I guess Hmm. okay quadrant one which is houses one, two, three, is about your identity, your personal identity. Quadrant two, which is houses four, five, and six, is about your personal expression. Quadrant three, houses seven, eight, and nine, is about your social identity. Quadrant four, which is houses 10, 11, 12, is about your social expression. Let's look at quadrant one. House one is Aries. And the ruling planet is Mars. Now, this is this won't be the last time we look at these two things. I just want you to fill them in. And we're going to talk about house number one and what it stands for in a person's chart. House number one is about your identity. It's also called the ascendant. And this is where what time you were born is important. Because that denotes what time um, or where and what cusp the, your first house will be on, will be in. The rising sign changes every two hours. And so that's why um, it's important to have an exact time. And it's abbreviated on your astrology chart as AC. So if you get your worksheet, one of your empty worksheets, whatever, whatever you're using right now, on the part of your um, chart where it's the first house, which is the ascendant, put AC. Okay. 
Okay. So the first house is ruled by Mars. The first house is the house of your identity. This is going to be how people view you. And this also has to do with like your face, your, your looks, your level of attraction, potential. This is the house of like first impressions. How do people, when people first see you, what are you giving? What are you giving off? Um, it's about your personality. Now, those are the like upfront things. And Aries is um, the first house is ruled by your head. Aries, the the sign of Aries is 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 your head. If you wanted to um, add that as well, and that and that does come in handy when reading people's charts. I also want to say that, um, as you know, looking at your chart and looking at the rulers of the houses, everybody's chart isn't directly um, lined up exactly. Some people's some people's ascendant does start off with Aries. Some people's charts are completely lined up exactly the way um, the ruling planets go, and, but most people's aren't. Okay. Okay, so the first house also has to do with your soul. It's more than just your personality and your identity. Your identity is your soul, your imprint. You don't even realize that your um, your mannerisms and like the your facial expressions that you make and um, what animates you. It's how you're coming across. Okay, let's go to the second house. The second house is ruled by Taurus and Venus. Ooh, I love Taurus and I love Venus. Okay. Check your chart to see what planets you have in this. Second house has to do with values. And that could be just money, um, finances, this is a house where somebody, if you have lots of planets here, you just like to have money for the sake of money. You don't even care how you get that money, which means you have to uh, watch for your values if you have a lot of planets in that area. Make sure that you are being on the up and up in how you get your money. Mm-hmm. The second house um, has to do with how you handle your finances. Are you... Or does money just slide right out of your hands? Do you get a whole lot of money and then it goes away really fast because you're generous with it? That's Jupiter. Do you Are you miserly with your money because you're afraid that you ain't going to have it tomorrow? That's Saturn. And so different um, planets in the houses will make you express that those those values about your money in a different way. As for someone that has Pisces in the second house will um, feel like um, more like whatever is mine is yours and what's yours is mine and they share freely with the intent that everybody um, is a good person like they are and they will have a downfall because Neptune is about blind spots when they realize that everyone can't be trusted like that and they often get the short end of the stick, and that's a lesson to protect your boundaries when it comes to money. So those are different ways that that energy can play out, but of course we'll talk more about those things in depth when we start adding all those different combinations together. It can also be about your inner values as a person. What do you value? Do you value education? Do you value um, traveling? Do you value... Um, communication, do you value um, hard work ethic? What do you value? And, and, and how do you want people to value you? Mm-hmm. What are your boundaries? Because the second house is about boundaries. When it comes to your possessions, Taurus is a very possessive sign. 
And we'll get into that as well. Not right now, though. The third house. Third house is ruled by Gemini and Mercury. Mm, it's a very interesting house. It's, um, Gemini is the, the sign of the twins. And so um, there's multiple layers in this house. It's a house of communication. And it's also the house of your neighbors and your siblings. Meaning that, like, people in your neighborhood, the teacher, the police officer, your best friends growing up, um, the principal, the, the, the gas station clerk, your neighborhood. I know um, nowadays, a lot of people don't play outside. So I wonder what people, uh, they, this generation's and this generation's coming up. Um, third house might look like compared to people who like me um, grew up playing outside I have when I talk about this house I, a lot of memories flood my mind of the people that impacted me uh, me and my uh, siblings I'm the oldest of six I have a stepbrother my mom had five kids though we had lots of outside time <laughs> It created amazing memories. There's lots of drama outside, child. It's a saga. It's a uh, it's a soap opera, you know. That's your life when you're a kid. Mm-hmm. And communication in the sense of your creativity and your voice. Like you standing up for yourself, using your voice. Empowering yourself with your voice. This is where you learn how to say yes or say no, or you communicate your values and your identity. You can put all these three houses together in the first quadrant now. The third house has to do with um, artistic expression, expression in general. It doesn't necessarily have to be artistic. It can be logical. But Gemini energy, third house energy, Mercury energy, um, it's about words and the power of words and, and where words can take you it can take you to the heavens and then take you to the depths of hell so how were you spoken to growing up that's a great question and, and what were you allowed to say and what weren't you allowed to say I didn't really ask those types of questions for the other two houses. Let me ask a first house question, okay? A a first, a great first house question is, if you ask your friends how they see you, first, first, how do you think you come across? Mm -hmm. And have you had other people tell you how you come across? It doesn't even have to be real deep, but it might be to you. It all depends you know, but it can just be like, oh, you're quiet or you're, you know, because people put a lot of emphasis on their sun sign, but isn't it interesting that it's your first house that most people will notice? For instance, my sun sign is in Scorpio, but people be like, I don't get that from you. I would think more like Virgo. Uh Aha. That's my ascendant. Yeah. Very cool. Calm. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Um, mm -hmm. Second, a second house question, a great second house question would be, what do you, what did your parents teach you to value? Because it's really, that's a really hard question to say, what do you value? A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know what they value. And they're like, then you ask the question, well, what's a value? But if I ask you what your parents um, taught you to value, you'll be able to tell me straight up and down. And then the next question would be, do you agree or disagree with those values as far as like what your inner guide guidance system is telling you? Now, from that standpoint, 
compare and contrast. What do you value? What does your spouse value compared to what you value? And then and you can check up on all your friendships. Do your friendships um, coincide with your values? That's interesting. Are you the type of person that need people around you to value the same things you value in order to be friends with them or not? That's an interesting question as well. Okay. That conclu- concludes the um, first three houses. Now we're going to get into your personal identity, which is the second quadrant. We're going to start off with house number four. House number four is ruled by Cancer and the Moon. Oh, whoa. Deep stuff. The moon is about your mom, your mother. It's a very symbiotic relationship. It's a very important, primitive relationship. The where even if you didn't have the best mother in the world, you have love for the mother. Just for that, for that essence of mom. It's it's such a huge, important archetype. And um I recently had a session um, with a young lady who was struggling in her relationship with her mom who didn't really want to be a mom. Her mom wanted to be a wild-natured woman. She wanted to be independent, and she didn't really want all of that, that, that title or that feeling on her. What do you do if your mom doesn't like being a mom? Or just goes through the motions of being a mom and doesn't know how to connect with the intimacy of Mother Nature and pass that on to her children. What do you do? That's a good question. Uh, And study in African intimacy and learn that um, in the Dagara tribe, there's many mothers in the village. There isn't just one mother for one child. There's multiple mothers In that tribe, there's no such thing as aunties or uncles. Everybody's mom or dad. (laughs) And some of the men are male mothers because, you know, some men are born with a a moon type of energy, the mothering type of energy, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was reading um, about African intimacy. I learned that... um, one of the ladies, the ladies, the author of the book that I was reading, she said that she came home to her village and she talked to her mother that gave birth to her and was like, you know, because of this and that, I got this and that from you and I'm struggling with this. And, she, and her mother was like, would you like to speak to your mothers about this? And all of the her mothers lined up <laughs> so that she can tell them her issues because isn't it really tough in um, western society taking on this um, European view of separation from one another to live in your own cubicle with your own issues and your own problems it's just really hard to take all of that energy on I guess I'm saying this because I don't want mothers to suffer any longer by believing that they have to be take on all of the load of being mother in their children's lives. Look at how big Mother Nature is. I mean, this whole astrology system is based off of the moon, the mother. Everything in our lives is ruled by her programming. She's the matrix, the moon that we are in, the symbiotic womb that we're in, this matrix that we're in. 
is the mother. That's the fourth house. Now, to make it more personal, because that was very expansive, to make it more personal, the fourth house is about your childhood, your relationship with your mom, and how your mom, you, I can also very much see how someone's mother's psychology is and how that, and how that um, made a person who they are in their subconscious mind and how they feel about themselves because of how their mother was or treated them. And I see a lot of nowadays narcissism in our society and a lot of people um, having to mother their mothers. And it's because of this patriarchy that we're under. I'm not blaming anybody, but it is. Having mothers that feel like they have to compete and be like men will cause a woman to get out of her natural feminine energy and maybe even never return, which is tragic. So you have a lot of women who are enraged. They think they're enraged because the men won't let them be equal. But they're really enraged because they're severing ties Their ties have been severed with Mother Moon and have gotten out of cycle and out of balance and out of tune with with what's most natural. And they have taken their children out of their natural state and way of being. So we have a nation and a world of people who are starving for true nourishment and nurturing. Here in this house, you can see, um, and some people have great mothers. I see that. I can see that as well. But for some reason, that had to be said. I can see. I can see. You can see the relationship with the mom, basically, and that's a and that's a really big deal when it comes to your um, personal expression. You can also see um, if someone spend a lot of time alone. Um, being creative Um, you can see uh, ancestry line starting to develop here because it's a legacy that gets passed on through the mother one mom passes things on to other mothers when you have daughters and sons you're creating people that are going to create families and um, uh, man I, I don't think people Look at how important they are and how much their children look up to them. Oh, you're a superstar in, in the eyes of your children, just like your mom's a superstar to you. Since that archetype, the mother archetype, has been um, has taken a step back, even though everything we do is in a mothering system. You know, the mother within women tends to not be held in high esteem by women within their own personal lives which causes depression and sickness sadness let's move on fifth house the fifth house is about creativity and it's ruled by Leo and the sun so uh, this is a fun house this is a very fun house this is where you can see um, how it's going to be for you to have children maybe how many children you're going to have like say you I see somebody with Jupiter in their fifth house of um, creativity it's also about sexual expression as well I might see you, there's a potential there since Jupiter is the planet of expansion that you could possibly have a big family a lot of kids You can also see what type of kids you're going to have. Like if you have Aquarius in the fifth house, then you most likely are going to have geniuses. (laughs) Really smart children. Mm -hmm. So this is how this house will um, tell you how you like to have fun 
or if you like to have fun at all. I, I have Capricorn in the fifth house, and fun eludes me. <laughs> <laughs> that is a struggle because working is fun for me Capricorn is about work and so anytime I go to a healing practitioner or a Reiki they be like you need to have fun and I'm like I thought I was they, they're like more <laughs> more <laughs> it's all I'm like oh <sighs> you know <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, the sixth house. We're moving it on. The sixth house is your house. Okay, this is an interesting house because it's also ruled by Mercury and um, it's Virgo, though. Okay, so uh, this is a very dynamic house. So, all right, it's ruled by your stomach, like eating food and stuff like that and it's ruled it's also um not this I don't mean to say ruled by but yeah it's it's about like your daily task the food you eat your schedule and this is another house of work and this is Virgo likes to be a servant so like no matter what work you do this is about like maybe part-time jobs or um, say this is not about your career this is just about like working and making money because you have to work and you need to make money and this will tell you like what type of jobs that you would that's, you would go after say for instance when I see someone with cancer in this house I'd be like so are you a chef you know are you a cook because the moon is about um, um, like comfort food and stuff like that. And you put that mixed with Virgo, you might have a little chef there, a little chef energy. Mm-hmm. A lot of times this stuff be true. Mm-hmm. And that's why astrology is all about case studies and observations because it could be a der- derivatives of things. It'd be a combination of things. Mm-hmm. And so this is a house where you would see how you live your everyday life. Are you organized? Are you disorganized? Are you, uh, um, are you going to keep up with a regimen? Or are you going to have a hard time? Um, it's the house of your health. So this is the house where you can... I'm still talking about the sixth house. This is a house where you can see, um, especially looking at transits and stuff, how someone is doing in their health Uh, for instance today I have a reading with someone that asked me specifically about their health so of course I went straight to their 6th house and I see that their 6th house is um, they have Capricorn in their 6th house and right now today is Wednesday August no September 4th 2019 and we are going through Saturn and Pluto and Capricorn and so that tells me that okay so he the Capricorn rules the knees the skeleton in the body and I'm sorry when I was going through all the houses I'll go through them again guys and I'll eventually you'll know um where all the places of the body and the zodiac signs and and what areas they rule of your body but I I also put out a work I put up a worksheet that you can download with that information okay so yeah Capricorn rules the knees and the skeleton and since Saturn is transiting through Capricorn and Pluto is, is, is is the planet of transformation then he's suffering going through a lot of pain He might have some stubborn, negative thoughts, things that are coming up to be healed through his body. Sometimes the universe gets through to us um, through our health. Before a disease or illness moves to 
giving us signals through our body, it usually gives us signals through our intuition first. And then if we don't listen, it moves on to our nervous system and emotional body. And then it moves to the physical body. And then it will start affecting the external life. And that's exactly um, what's happening for him. So I want to give you guys a warning with these personal houses. When you start to learn how to read the chart, you'll be tempted to go up to people and, um, and tell them what you see in their chart. But people are sensitive and if you're not willing to or have the time to or the knowledge to assist them all the way through the process of their healing, then I would suggest that you bring up really um, harsh issues. Even if you see it in their chart. Because you could do damage like that. It will make people feel picked on, probed at, and kind of like a science project. Because if you're studying astrology, then you most likely don't really take energies personally. You look at them from a more scientific observation point of view. But in going in session with him, I will be asking him what he's already doing, what he's already done, what his doctors have um, suggested, and mostly how does he feel right now at this time in his process, and how he feels about trying new things, so that I can see what type of help he needs, and what I can suggest to be of great support and not do more damage and harm because I'm excited to read his chart. So, and especially in houses like this and someone's asking um, for help, then they're desperate because they've been suffering for a long time. Be gentle. That's all I'm saying. Be gentle with people and especially with issues, their psychology and their family and their mom and Um, Siblings, these are all very personal houses. Okay. So questions for the fourth, fifth, and sixth house. Okay, the fourth house, what you would ask about your relationship with your mother. That can be um, a great question to ask, or it can be a painful question to ask, depending upon the relationship. But nonetheless... It's, this is about you getting to know yourself. Okay, the fifth house, be like, what do you like to do for fun? Or or what's your sexual style? Because that, it also tells you, like, what your um, sexual way is or how you're turned on. Ooh. <laughs> and in the sixth house, um, you will ask, like, okay, um, how is my health, my mental health every day? Is there anything I can do to help myself um, be better organized? Or, you know, how can I get through to myself when it comes to having, like, a daily ritual? What's going to help me out the most? Meaning, you know, sometimes I talk to people and they feel guilty that they don't like to meditate. But I'll be like, girl, I don't meditate every day. I, I don't like to sit still all the time. Um, so I belly dance and sometimes I just, I just make sure I turn on my chant. If I don't do nothing else, I turn on my, my ganache chant and I just over and over again, over and over again. Right. If I don't do nothing else, do something to boost your energy up every day. All right. Now we're going to move on to quadrant three. Houses 7, 8, and 9, which is your social identity. 